All right, welcome to week nine. Hopefully you had a somewhat restful week. Might not have been for some of you, but you know, somewhat restful week. The interesting thing about how this course is organized is that the two halves are like two separate mini courses. So you get the content from weeks one to six, you get tested and evaluated, and then we just don't go visit it again. All you need from those courses, from the first half, is remembering how to read a diagram, remembering things like, you know, data types and nulls and not nulls. That's what you need to remember from the first half. So you just have some general concepts. You're not going to be testing any of it. So we rearranged it so it was like too many courses that were stuck together. So we're starting out fresh. And um, good, that is recording. So we are diving into SQL for the second half, and that's all we're going to be doing for the second half. So a little bit of history before we get into it. SQL was developed by IBM in the late 70s. At this point is when I tell people, notice I'm saying SQL and not saying SQL. SQL is an initialism. Not an acronym. You pronounce an acronym. An initialism, you say the letters. Because if we treated the name of the company that created SQL the same way, we'd be calling it IBM, not IBM. And there's a reason why SQL has stuck around for so long. When IBM first created the language, they called it SQL, S-E-Q-U-E-L. And that lasted a grand total of six months till they got sued for copyright infringement because a company in the UK had created a database product called SQL before IBM ever started creating SQL. So IBM goes, well, mm, let's get rid of all the vowels. We have a product name, SQL. I prefer you use SQL and not SQL because if, when people say SQL, it makes me want to stick a pencil in my ear. Um, my daughter has fun. She'll come by my room. She'll just go, SQL. And just keep walking just to piss me off. Uh, fun of 23 year olds. So that's that. Their SQL has been around since the Spanish. They release new versions every once in a while. Uh, by new versions, it doesn't mean that they're creating a new language. They are creating a standard saying if you want to say your database product is SQL 2008 compliant, you must provide these features. If they're not telling the Oracle and IBM and you know Microsoft how they're going to implement these features. They say you must have these features in your product. You decide how you're going to implement them. Which means that the SQL language has variations between different servers. The most popular standard that everybody agrees to is SQL 99. You'll notice it's not even on that list. Pretty much everything you're going to learn for the rest of the semester is SQL 99. Everything else that they added since is just fancy stuff, such as including direct XML in the database. You can query XML. You can query JSON. Object-oriented concepts. Uh, for example, the database server you guys are going to be using for the second half of this term, Postgres, supports inheritance, supports overloading. You can actually create a table and inherit it into another table. You're not going to learn any of that. Just don't even bother to take notes. I'm just saying it supports it. Postgres is the most advanced open source database product available. It does everything and then some stuff that the other ones don't do. Uh, it's pretty spectacular, actually. Um, the textbook and some slides will use syntax from SQL Server 2019. So if you've grabbed a copy of the textbook, whichever way you've grabbed a copy of the textbook, Pretty much all the examples are SQL Server 2019. We're going to be using PostgreSQL for demos and labs. I'm going to warn you now, I'm not going to go into detail for every command. There's a lot to the SQL language. I will be teaching you guys the basics. There's no time in five weeks to cover more than the basics. 
So at the bottom of this slide, there's a URL. That URL is probably one of the best tutorials for SQL in general, but it's targeted specifically to Postgres, which is what you guys are gonna be using for the second half of this term. So after I'm done, and if you're not sure how to do some of the things that I'm gonna be going over in class, this is actually a really good first step because they actually do a fantastic job explaining everything in detail. So it's worth visiting that URL. All right, so SQL is a data sub language. It's not a fully featured programming language. You can think of it along the lines of Java, C, Python, they're general purpose languages. You can write pretty much whatever you want with them. SQL is known as a single purpose language. It's designed to do one thing and do it really well. Its entire purpose for existence is creating and processing data and metadata, also known as, table, as database structures. Um, SQL is ubiquitous in the enterprise. Unless the product is literally a NoSQL database, such as MongoDB or Couch or Cassandra, it is SQL. There is, a, I have yet to seen a single business that does not use SQL in one way or another. SQL is so useful that they've now created an SQL dialect for NoSQL databases, which is defeating the whole point of the NoSQL database. Go figure that one out. So SQL programming is a critical skill. And this is where I'm going to put in a two second anecdote from my own life. I went through college. Mine was a three year program. I liked SQL, so I did fairly well in that course. I ignored the, the administration course, barely passed it, and I'll admit it. I'm not ashamed to admit that I kind of screwed up. And uh, there was a couple of other courses, and I did okay, but not that great. Because I told myself, I'm never going to work in database. First job database. Second job, database. Third job, migrating a database. Fourth job, database for the last 23 years. So let me tell you, if you think you're never going to work with a database you're and you intend to be programming, unless you're writing like device drivers or like writing software like Corel Draw or Adobe Photoshop, guess what you're going to be using? Database. If you want to be a programmer in the government, database. So more specifically, SQL. It's an important skill to have. Okay, so SQL, the language of SQL, is broken down into separate categories. Um, unlike languages like Java and Python, where really you have Java, you have Python. It really doesn't have subsets of functionality. SQL actually has clear divisions in its functionality. There's the DDL. The DDL is used for creating tables, the relationships, altering tables, like adding columns and that kind of stuff. Um, it's got uh, the ability to get rid of objects, that kind of stuff. It is the, um, basically the guy, these, this is the language used by, you know, contractors building a house. You're building a house, they're the guys putting up the walls. That's DDL. Uh, DML is used for queries. So this is actually playing with the data, inserting data, updating, deleting, that kind of stuff. This is, you know, basically decorating your house. You're putting in the furniture in your house. SQL, PSM, um, I really wish they wouldn't include this in the slide uh, because not all database servers have uh, persistent stored modules. Um, actual fact, Postgres doesn't have them. <laughs> so, you know. Um, TCL, Transaction Control Language, uh, that one's a really, really small subset. We are going to flirt with it at the end of the semester. Um, I am going to introduce it to you guys, explain to you guys what it does, and that'll pretty much be the end of that conversation. It's more of an advanced topic. Uh, then there's DCL, which is basically security involving users, passwords, uh, permissions, that kind of stuff. In this course, we're going to worry about the first two. Uh, if you're really curious about the DCL, and for those of you that have gone to the YouTube channel where I upload my, my recordings, if you look for CST8250, 
I covered DCL in that course. So if you're really curious about DCL, you're welcome to go learn it. You don't need it for this course. And it's taught specific to MySQL. So, you know, it might be useful to you, it might not be. So there's a few things you should know about SQL. And um, actual fact, I meant to mention this. For those of you that looked at these slides before today or printed the slides before today, you'll notice there'll be some slight variations. I uploaded a slightly updated version of the slides just before the class because I went through the slides and realized that I had updated these slides and I grabbed the slides from the course lead and he kept the old slides, which weren't Postgres specific and it was missing pieces. So there'll be a few slides in here that may not be. If you have this slide in your printout, you're good. Um, so a few things to know about SQL. SQL keywords are not case sensitive. So you know how you know Java function names are case sensitive? The keywords are not case sensitive. Object names may be case sensitive depending on the database engine you're using. For example, MySQL doesn't care. It's totally case insensitive. Microsoft SQL Server depends on what code page it's been installed, what language it's been installed in. So if you're installing in a Latinit language, that, in other words, something that uses the Latin character set, like English or French, it'll not be case sensitive. If you install, no, sorry, it, yeah, it will be uncase insensitive. But if you install in Cyrillic, it becomes case sensitive for some unknown reason, even though Cyrillic is case insensitive. I don't know. It's a, it's a Microsoft thing. Oracle lies. Oracle stores the whatever object name twice, the way you typed it in originally and then in uppercase. So whenever you're trying to access an object, it uppercases whatever you're typing in, compares it to what's in the database, and then returns to you the nice name. So it lies. It, it pretends to be case insensitive, but it, it is. Uh, you know, and then uh, Postgres is anally case sensitive. It cares so much about the case of the object names. It was written on Unix originally, then ported to Linux, and then finally ported to Windows. And something you guys are going to learn in your level two Linux course is that Linux is very case sensitive. Unix is case sensitive. So Postgres is case sensitive. It's actually a good thing for you guys because it'll help you develop good habits. It's better having to work against something that's a little stricter with you than something that lets you shoot yourself in the foot. And you'll develop bad habits because you're like, oh, yeah, blah, 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 blah. And then you try to do something and it doesn't work because suddenly you got the habit of you don't care. So you have like months of reprogramming to get over those bad habits. Uh, the command terminator is a semicolon. Congratulations. That one you guys have from Java. It's the same here. And if there are spaces in the table or column names, you need to escape the object name, which is why I say don't put spaces in your object names. Use underscores, camel case. Uh, sorry, every time I think camel case in a database makes me want to Ralph. But, you know, underscores instead of spaces. Because <laughs> different database servers do the escaping differently. MySQL uses a backtick. If you don't know what the back is, it's the other character with your tilde on your keyboard. So under the escape key above your tab key, the very most leftmost key, there's like a quote mark that goes the wrong way. That's a backtick operator. Postgres, IBM DB2 and Oracle use double quotes. Microsoft SQL Server uses square brackets. Therefore, if you don't use spaces, you don't have to worry about escaping. Therefore, you don't need, because if you use spaces, that means you have to write your code specific to the database engine and or write a bunch of wrappers to tell it, hey, it's IBM, so we're going to run the query like this. Oh, it's Microsoft SQL Server, so we're going to run the query like this. Just don't put spaces. It'll save you so much grief in the future. All right. so. Here's the SQL equivalent of hello world. Select star from some table in this case. We actually gonna go, after today, we're gonna be focusing on the select statement for like three weeks. That's where the meat and potatoes of SQL is. But 
you'll see me as I'm going to do some demos today because I'm going to go through some slides. And I'm just going to sit here and do a bunch of commands and ignore the rest of the slides until and then just go through to make sure I don't forget anything at the end. You'll see me do a select from whatever table. That allows you to look at the contents of the table. That's the purpose of this. So I decided to throw in a slide with this one little bit in here just so that you guys aren't shocked when I type a command you haven't seen yet. This is saying select everything from whatever table it is I want to pull from. And you'll see when I go through my demo um, what there is. Okay, so now we're going to get down to the real purpose of the lecture, which is um, a DDL, the Data Definition Language. And the very first statement that we look at is the create table command. Create table is used for creating tables. Actual fact, this slide's a bit misleading, bit misleading. The actual command is create. Then you tell it what you want to create, and then you define it. So you could go create view, create table, create user, create. So create is the command you use to create something. The something is what you say next, and then you define it. And the funny thing is, is that I swear the guys who developed the SQL language were a bunch of pocket protectors sitting in different rooms, not communicating with each other as pocket protector types are wont to do. Because every set of commands looks completely different than the others for some unknown reason, which is the biggest learning curve for people learning SQL is the fact that every command looks different. Therefore, you're learning a bunch of different little syntaxes. Not any big syntaxes, just a bunch of little ones that are all a little bit different from each other. So the create table command is create table. You give it a name of a table. You define the columns, any constraints, close the parentheses, and a semicolon, and the command will run. What does that actually look like? Uh, I'll show you guys that in a second. I keep forgetting that I have a slide before my exam, my real example. So the column and table constraints. So over here where it says, you know, optional constraint, those include things like primary key, foreign key, whether columns are null or not null, whether there's unique columns, um, check constraints. Uh, the check constraint I'm not a fan of, um, I'll admit it. Why am I not a fan of the check constraint is because not all database servers implement it the same way. So it's not universal. What I tried to teach you guys is something known as ANSI standard SQL. In other words, SQL that will work on all servers the same way without having to learn all kinds of new things. Um, the check constraint, for example, MySQL, you create a check constraint, MySQL is like a two-year-old that goes, okay, this is the rule, I'm going to ignore it. You create a table with a check constraint, then it's as if it never even happened. So MySQL doesn't do check. Postgres does check. Um, and then the default keyword, technically not a constraint, it allows you to set a default value. All right, so here's my first example. Yes, it's got camel case because I tried to keep the example pretty much the same as what was there before. Um, this is one of the things that did change before I uploaded because I, when I originally went through the slides, I had my version, but then I was told that the slides had updated for the semester. So I grabbed the existing, the teachers, the official course group, and he didn't use the Postgres specific syntax on these examples. He used the MySQL syntax, but you guys are working with Postgres for the second half. Therefore, why would you, why would we give you the MySQL syntax? So these slides are on Brightspace. So if you need to go and grab these from Brightspace, they're there. All right. So create table artist, open your parentheses, and then you will see it's pretty common. It's going down artist ID. So that's the column name. That's the data type. Then you have not null or null. So whether it's required or not. This over here, the generated always as identity, that's a Postgres specific thing. Um, every database server does auto-incrementing columns differently. Uh, generated always as identity is basically what has become a standard. So this particular syntax will work in Postgres, in Oracle and Microsoft SQL Server, but it will not work in IBM DB2 or MySQL. Just, you know, your mileage may vary depending on what you're working with. The generated always as identity is 
Postgres is a way of creating a um, synthetic key or surrogate key. So it'll go one, two, three, four, and automatically populate it based on the fact that it's generated. And generated always means every single time you add a row, generate. So that's why it's generated always. Um, last name, character varying 25, not null. And you'll see first name, varkar25, not null. So varkar25 is universal. That'll work in everything but Oracle. Because uh, an Oracle is varkar2. I don't know why. Uh, character varying is Postgres specific syntax. I chose to put both in this slide so you guys could see the two ways of writing it. Um, Varkar works everywhere. When you're doing your labs and your assignments, Varkar is fine. But I'm just showing you guys that if you go online and try to find help how to do something in Postgres, you may see it listed as character varying instead of Varkar. It's the same thing. Then we have car 30 for nationality. So fixed length character field 30. I talked about those for the break. Um, date of birth, date, null. Date deceased, date, null. Those are optional. Uh, here's something cool. If something's allowed to be null, in other words, it's not not null, in other words, it's not required, you can skip the keyword null and it'll work. Because by default, it's null, unless you tell it it's not null. Uh, then we have the constraint. We gave it a name, primary key artist ID. Then we got another constraint that says it's a unique combination. So last name, first name combined must be unique. So those are a couple of different constraints. When we look at this, can anybody notice something peculiar about the SQL language? Say compared to Java or Python or whatever language you may have been exposed to. What was that? I heard a tiny little voice. No, okay. No takers, yep. No, God, no, no. This, it's space it's space agnostic. One space, 20 spaces, it doesn't give a shit. No. No, because that's like Java. It's Englishy. You read it, and it's words. And the words make sense. They actually describe what they're doing. Unlike Java, which is a little weird. If you've ever played in Python, it's even more weird. If you've ever worked in like other languages like Mathematica or R or any of those stats languages, this is downright like Shakespeare compared to those languages. Which leads me to the another little aside about the SQL language. SQL was originally created Yes, with programmers in mind, but the programmers weren't the number one target for this language. It was managers. Because back then, apparently managers were, I, I, I don't know what they were thinking at IBM. I guess they had a really high opinion of managers. But they figured they could actually write a language that you could eventually train a manager to be able to run commands and actually get their own data and run their own reports. Therefore, when they went, they had the concept of, let's create a language that is English-like, that all the keywords are English keywords, no weird shortened up anything. The function names, on the other hand, like some of the function names are shortened, but even they're not that weird. Um, but you'll notice like everything is like, Artist ID, integer, it's not null. Generated always as identity. Constraint, artist PK. It's a primary key referring to that field. You can actually read the pieces of SQL almost like a sentence and derive concepts from it. Here's our second version of this one. It includes, well, it's a table that's, it's a child table. So you have the artist table. This is the works table. The usual things are in here. The integers there, our car fields are there. Uh, you got a Varkar 1000 for shits and giggles, not null. All right, you got a default value, which we mentioned momentarily ago. Default, you'll notice here's a string. So it's saying that if I were to add a piece of data in this table and I decided not to include the description, it would automatically put in unknown provenance. 
as the default value. So if you choose to not include something because you know there's a default value, it'll auto-populate, which is cool. We have artist ID, INT, if we remember, artist ID is the primary key from the other table. Now you'll see, here's our constraint for our primary key, here's our unique, that's two things we saw already. Constraint, artist foreign key, it's a foreign key that references the artist table and the artist ID. So artist ID in the artist table maps out to the artist in this table, artist ID. Remember in MySQL Bench when you created your foreign keys? Clicked on one table, clicked on another table, it would automatically draw a line and add the field. This is the code that happens if you were gonna convert that diagram into SQL. That's the line right there. This, this block right here is the line. And you'll notice there's two other things down here, an update no action on delete no action. Those are two optional parameters to the foreign key creation. It has three choices for these commands. On update, no action means, or actually I'm gonna ignore on update because on update it's almost never used. On delete, no action. That means that this is a child table. If I try to delete the parent and the parent detects it has children, it's gonna allow no action. In other words, it's gonna cancel the delete. I'll actually demonstrate that for you guys in a bit. You have on delete, set null. So if your foreign key was not set to null instead of not null, you could actually, when you delete the parent, it basically goes to the child record say, you don't have a parent. You never had a parent. You, you came to this world without any parentage. It, you just popped out of nowhere. It's very Jedi. And then you've got undelete cascade. If you delete the parent record, it kills the child record too. So delete the parent, it just wipes out the whole family. And it's very fast. So here's a table that explains, you know, the whole parent optional, parent required stuff. Essentially, it boils down to this. If the parent is optional, you set the foreign key to null. If it's required, you set the foreign key to not null. This whole slide is just saying, if it's required, it's not null. Otherwise, it's null. And then you've got the casual relationships. Um, casual relationships usually aren't a good thing um, in the real world, and they're even worse than a database. Sorry. Hey, you'll remember this. Um, because what happens when a casual relationship, mean, what that means is you create a column for a foreign key, but you don't enforce it. So that means you could put anything into that foreign key. It has no connection to reality. So you can get into a state where you suddenly have a bunch of child records where it has values for the parent ID that have no, no connection to anything in the real world. So it's basically database cancer. The data gets corrupted. It's terrible. So I tend to say avoid casual relationships in your database because it's going to make your database stick. Just avoid casual relationships. Use enforced relationships. If you're going to have a foreign key, enforce it. That's the point of a relational database is that if you're going to have a foreign key, you're going to enforce the rules. Having columns there and you don't enforce the fact that they're related is, yeah that. All right. Um, uh, sorry. It's, it's issue today. So if I want to modify my something in the database, the command is called alter. You're going to alter. You're going to modify it. And specifically, if you're going to alter a table, it's alter table. That's a shocker. And alter table is used to change the structure of the existing table. You can use it to add, remove, and change columns. You can use it to add or remove constraints. Um, you can use it to rename the table even if you wanted to. So, for example, here's adding a new column to a table. Alter table customer, add my call car five, it's allowed to be null. Some database servers require you to have the column keyword in there, so it'd be alter table customer add column. 
my call, I'm car five, no. That's actually, it sounds pretty much like an English statement, doesn't it? Like alter table customer, add a column. And then you got the, the removing the column. Alter table customer, drop column, my column. So you're gonna alter the table and you're gonna get rid of a column and it goes away. Um, it, the slide says the column keywords only used when dropping a column, not when adding one. Yes, for Microsoft SQL Server and yes, for MySQL. In Postgres, the keyword column is optional, but it's usually recommended so that you are more aware of what you are doing. It's not gonna make any difference to the server, but it makes you more aware of what you are doing. Um, because this is where I'm gonna point something out. Guess what database servers do not have? The other group got it on the first try. Can anybody guess what database servers don't have? There's no undo. You run the command, it's done. I, I say it's like driving down the highway with no brakes on. Everything you do will have an impact. Another example I've used is you took a sledgehammer, you threw it through a window. It happened instantly. You can't undo it. Database servers are the same thing, which is why I tell people, try to be very explicit. Don't take the shortcuts in some of the commands because then you might not be really paying attention to what you're doing. So use the full form of the commands. It's important. Um, alter table, add a constraint. Alter table, drop a constraint. Um, this one here is creating a check constraint. So it's basically saying, uh, if the last the last name is not allowed to be uh, Robert's no pay, whatever that's supposed to be. Um, you can add a constraint as a press, such as a primary key. You could add constraint as a foreign key. So let's say you have a table structure already in place. You suddenly discover you need to add a new table. So you create a new table that's gonna be a parent. You add a new column to your child table, and then you can add a foreign key. So you can actually add foreign keys after the table has been created by doing alter table commands. And then it's really, really easy to drop a table and SQL, it's literally drop table, whatever it's called. If you have a table called customers, you go drop table customers and it's gone. Uh, now, if there's child, like if there's um, foreign keys involved, it won't let you drop it. So you can't accidentally drop a table that has children, but you could accidentally drop a table because it's dangerous that way. Um, alter table, rename. Uh, I am 90% sure those are MySQL specific syntax, those two. Um, for renaming columns, if I remember right, it's a slightly different in Postgres. Um, but that's pretty much what it looks like. So you alter table, rename column from this to that. And you can actually do alter table and change a column's data type, all kinds of things. So if there's child tables, you have to delete the child tables. You have to drop the child tables first. So if you want to get rid of the parent table, you got to, you know, make the kid tables not exist anymore. So get rid of the children, then you can get rid of the parent. Otherwise, you know, it won't let you get rid of the parent because the kids are screaming that they exist. No, literally, I'll show you guys. It literally tells you, no, please don't. Well, not quite, but it's not far from that. Um, the other choice you have is you can tell the child tables to, you can drop the constraints. So you can tell the children, don't care that you have parents, then you kill the parent. So that's another choice you have is you can drop the constraints and then drop the parent table. Those are your two ways of taking care of this. Um, and then we have truncate. Okay, this is where I'm going to drop away from the slide decks and start doing demonstrations. Okay, so I'm using PG Admin. Actually, I'm gonna close this so that I can show you guys where we're starting out. So when you launch PG Admin, and we've all experienced on how nice and slow it is to launch. Um, and it has nothing to do with how powerful your computer happens to be. I just don't know why it's fast on some people's computers and slow on others. I've yet to figure out why. <clears throat> so 
when you launch and you get past the master password, it'll look like this. On the left, you've got a list of databases. Um, if you want to create yourself a new database to follow along, you right-click, create database, you give it some name, and hit save. And I'll save that one. And there it is. I just created a new database. That's empty. I'm actually going to use the example database because that's the one I've been using. Uh, when we look in here, um, you can see that this has no tables. This database has never been touched. We're about to touch it and do all kinds of things to it. Um, so once we've connected to a database, and you can tell if you're connected because the database is yellow. When you're not connected, it's gray. Pretty straightforward to know the difference. So I'm gonna click on this. It's this icon right here that you guys are gonna need for your labs. It says query tool. So right over here, I'm gonna click on that. This grinds for a second, and it brings us, looks like a text editor, which is basically what this is. It has some pretty cool features, um, and I'll show you some of these as we go. But first thing I'm going to do is um, create a table. Man, my typing today is not there. So what's this editor finally gave us the amazing feature of it creates the closing parentheses for you. Um, previously, it didn't have this feature. So I always tell people, you know, make sure if you're going to open a parentheses, always close your parentheses. I'm going to slap in my semicolon so that it's there. Okay, so this is my create table command. If I try to run it as it is, it's going to give me an error because I have no columns defined. So I'm going to go parent ID. It's an integer. Um, and we're going to go uh, auto. No, it's generated, generated, always as identity. Okay, so this is creating my surrogate key. It's going to be auto incrementing. It's going to go one, two, three, four, five, automatically for me. It's cool. I'm going to go name. Uh, no, no comma. And this is going to be a var car seventy five. Really helps if you type it in right. 75, it's going to be not null. I'm going to go uh, date of birth, it's a date. Also not null. And I'm going to put in the word active. It's going to be a, excuse me, a Boolean. We're going to set the default to true. So every time I add a row, if I don't include the active, like data for active, it will automatically make it true for me. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit run. And you'll get on the messages, you'll get some sort of feedback. If it worked, if it didn't work, that kind of thing. Um, for you guys, for your labs, just so you know, if you forgot, like you, you're working in your current session and you uh, forgot to copy this out to save it for your lab, under query history, you can see every command, like, like here's what I was doing with the previous class. Um, it only keeps so much history. And there's it is, and you can actually copy it from there and, you know. No, no, this is just so that it, you know what command you ran when you screwed up. Or if you need to run the same command over and over, but you need to run one command, then another command, then one command, then another command. You can go into the history and actually see what where you're at. Uh, so it's cool because you can go copy, and now I'm going to go to Notepad or Notepad plus plus, and I'm going to paste in my command that I just did for you guys. I'm going to be trying to remember to keep track of all the commands I run, so I can give you guys basically a dump of what I typed in today. Okay, so back over here. So here's my table. Now I'm going to do my first select star from a parent table. Go. My data output comes out at the bottom. 
Your guys' is it might be a tab up here. If you want it at the bottom like me, you can grab the tab and you'll notice right in the middle here, see this weird little gray, like multiple arrows? This allows you to decide where it's going to be docked. So you can choose to dock on that side, dock to there, dock to the bottom, that kind of thing. I'm not going to move my modifications, but that's how my data output got to the bottom, is I just dragged it. Okay, so there's nothing inside my parent table. I am going to um, show you guys a few common error messages um, that I did. In actual fact, I made a really big mistake when I created this table. I forgot something really important. Can somebody tell me what I forgot to do? I did forget to do it with the other group, so you guys get to see a different mistake. What does this table not have? I forgot to create the primary key. So you get to watch the very first uh, drop table command. See, as you'll notice that I just wrote this one lowercase because it doesn't care. You can choose to run a single command in here by just highlighting and hit the go button. And you'll see drop table succeeded. So now I'm going to modify my table to go, uh, I'm going to add a constraint. I'm going to give it a name, aptpk, because I'm lazy, I won't type the whole thing. It's a primary key. And it's going to be uh, parent ID is the primary key. So now I'm going to go run. Boom, it worked. Now to show you guys a few error messages, because learning what the error messages are is just as important as learning the language. I'm going to hit run again without changing anything. We got ourselves a new error message. It says, relation, a parent table already exists. What do you think that means? Yeah, exactly. There's already something there called that. It already exists. So that's what it's saying. You can't create the same thing twice. Database servers are really picky about their names of things. Therefore, you can't do it twice. Another error message you may see is, you'll notice I'll take out a comma off the end there and I'll run it. You'll go syntax error at or near, in this case, says DOB. If we go back to our query window, it's actually underlining DOB. DOB is not the actual error. The error is that I forgot a comma. Basically, the error message is saying there was an error when I, I noticed there's something wrong when I got to here. It doesn't mean that's where the error is. Like, you know, in Java, it tells you you have an error on line 26, character 34. You don't get that in SQL. You get a shit, I don't know what to do at this point because something is wrong. So you have to go backwards from wherever you were at to the previous command. Like further up in the command until you find out what you did wrong. Like it won't tell you what's wrong. It'll just say there's something wrong. So if I take out the entire data type here and I go run, it's going to go, there's a syntax error near a comma. And then you got to go look at it and go, oh, what did I do wrong? Oh, I forgot the data type. Um, debugging SQL is a bit of detective work. It's not as explicit as something that's compiled. All right, now I'm going to create a second table. So I'm going to, yeah. Makes no difference. It just runs whatever you selected. Good. That's actually something that's good to notice, and I'll uh, bring that up in a second. Um, most people ask me why there's commas. You ask why there's no commas. So it's the opposite of what the question I usually get, which is good. A child table. So I'm going to go uh, child ID integer generated generated always as identity, identity, hey, can't forget my comma, uh, parent ID, integer, not null. Um, why is it tabbing sometimes and not sometimes not? God, that drives me nuts. There we go, tab. Uh, child name, actually let's go child name so it's always obvious, name, 
varkar 50 uh not null yeah good enough so i'm gonna go constraint uh child pk uh primary key child child id comma constraint child fk foreign key parent id so this is saying oops shoot id this parent id here is referring to this column here so it's saying this column right here that we've got set as an integer not null is going to be the column used as the foreign key references a parent table parent id so now it's saying this foreign key references this table so it's saying the value of this column here comes from a parent table and this column in the parent table and then and now you got the optional things uh, such as on update no action on delete no action and let's see if i got this right on the first try go no i got an error no i got a typo yay so to answer his question why does the last one not have a comma because that's the rule so everything is comma delimited until you get to the last one and then there's no comma because there's nothing after it so when you're defining a table, there's no comma on the last item because there's no comma on the last item. It's, that's it. It's just, if you actually have a comma at the last item, I'll put one in just so you guys can witness what happens. You hit run, it goes, got a syntax error. Near closing parentheses. Usually that's a pretty safe bet that you got a trailing comma that you shouldn't have. So I'm going to run that. Child table created. I'm going to create a second child table uh, for shits and giggles. I will get an error. The child PK already exists. Postgres is kind of special that way. Um, even for the names of primary keys and foreign keys, you can't reuse the name of those keys. So even the name of the keys has to be unique in the database server. So I'm going to hit go again. And now I created a second table. If I come into my example here and You'll notice that I don't see anything in tables. If I go refresh, here's the tables I just created. So if you're not seeing what's happening, you just do a refresh and I'll show it to you. Yeah. Okay, so the semicolon, hang on, let me just go grab my history here so I don't lose it or forget to put it in. So the semicolon is required when you're running more than one command at once. If you're running one command, which this is one command, you're creating a table. It's only one command. You have to have, you don't need the semicolon. If you are running multiple commands, you need to have the semicolon to separate the commands. That's just, it's a quirk. All right. So. I'm going to alter my, so I'm going to go select star from a parent table. Here's my parent table. I'm going to alter the table. Alter table, uh, uh, parent table, add column, email, farcar150. I'm adding a column. So altering table, a parent table, add column, email, data type, varkar150. Hello, Mac. <laughs> um, and I'm going to run it. An actual fact here, I'll demonstrate the whole semicolon thing. Whoever was asking, was that you? So if I go select star from a parent table, okay, and I forget the semicolon, I'm going to go run. And it goes, we have an error near this, which means you screwed up somewhere before that. So if I put in my semicolon, the last one doesn't need the semicolon, but you can put it anyways. 
Now I can run the whole script as a single script, hit go. And you will see now that it's selected star from a parent table and there's my email column that I just added. I'm gonna to try to do this again. I'm gonna hit go. Column email of relation to parent table already exists. Congratulations, you can't add the same column twice. I'm guarantee you guys are gonna see this error message in lab six. Um, because I'd be surprised if at least not one person in the group doesn't see that error message. All right, let me just go grab that piece of history. Copy. Like such. Okay. Now I'm going to go into what would be for the rest of the lecture, the rest of the slides. I'm actually going to do it as a demo. And then I'm just going to go through the slides just to make sure I don't forget anything. All right. The first thing we're going to look at is insert. Insert is the command we use to add data to the database. Can anybody guess why they chose the word insert instead of add? Not just fancy, but think back at who this was targeted at. What do managers do with filing cabinets? They open the drawer, they insert the paper into the folder. So they, the, whoever the pocket protector was that was writing this part of the language said, managers understand about inserting a, p a piece of paper into a filing cabinet, so we're going to insert a row in the table. Mind blown. Even better, wait till you see the rest of this. Insert into, that's because you're going to insert the paper into a folder, a parent table. This is where you define which columns you're going to populate. So in here, I'm going to go name, uh, date of birth, and email. Yes, everybody asked me, why does it highlight the word name? The word name is technically an S a reserved SQL keyword that nobody has ever used. So every SQL highlighting tool will always, like code coloring tool, will always highlight the word name as a keyword. It's not a keyword. Nobody's ever used it. It just is defined as a keyword in the standard. That's all. Then we're going to define the values. And I'm going to show you guys all kinds of error messages. So first things first, name is Bob. Date of birth is 1975, 03, 07. And email address is uh, bob at bob.com because I'm so original. Okay, and I'm gonna just select this and run it. Bang, insert one. If I were to go back to my query now and go select star from a parent table, and I hit go, here's Bob. Now, you'll notice I did not include parent ID or active because the parent ID is a surrogate key. It was set to automatically generate. Therefore, if you don't include it, it'll give it the next value in the sequence. Be very careful with surrogate keys that automatically increment. Because if you insert a value into there, and then later on you do an insert that does not include the value, you may have a key conflict where the sequence will try to give you a value that's already in there because it doesn't know any better. And it, uh, let's picture it like this. Uh, you know when you go somewhere where you have to take a number to wait your turn? So imagine, instead of grabbing a number, you take a little piece of paper and you write, write you look at the next number on the thing, you go, oh, yeah, that's, that's right, so you go, okay, so I'm number 36. So you're sitting there with your little 36. But the next number on the turnstile is 36. So somebody says, number 36. And you go up and you go, I'm 36, right? Good. Somebody else grabs a 36, and now that 36 has already been used. So now you've got a problem. That's why you you don't, if you're using an auto incrementing primary key, never include the primary key value. The other one you'll notice is active. I didn't include active because I set the default to true. Therefore, if I don't include active as a value, like as a column and it's matching value, it will put in true automatically for me. I can choose to create another one and add active again, and now include 
false. And I can do that insert. And now you can see that it is false. But if I don't include active, it'll always be true. And here's something else that's kind of nifty for you guys. I'm going to go in, run, 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 run a bunch. Okay. And I'm going to select that. Look at that. It let me insert the same thing over and over and over again. Why? Because I'm using a surrogate key, so every row is unique. It don't care. Unless you had unique constraints, it really doesn't care. You can put the same thing in there a dozen times. It cares not. Okay, time for some error messages so that you guys have experienced error messages. All right, so I've got four columns up here. I'm going to take off the false down here, and I'm going to run this. We're getting an error message that says, insert has more target columns than expressions. What that means is that you have four columns listed here that you want to provide values, but you only gave, well, you gave less. So in the case, we gave three values for four columns. The database server doesn't know what's supposed to go in the fourth column. You said, I'm going to give you a value for the fourth column, then you left them on red. It's expecting something, and it got nothing back. Alternatively, we can also go the other way around, where it's saying has more expressions than target columns. This is basically telling you, hey, bruh, you gave, you're giving me more than I wanted. So just too much, right? So remove it and fix your query or add the matching columns, whatever it is you're trying to do. Um, One last one will be, um, actually, I'm going to include active again. And let's all remember, active is a Boolean, right? This person is active. Does that look like a Boolean? So I'm going to go go. Invalid input syntax for type Boolean. It's basically telling you, hey, you're trying to put something in the database. That doesn't match the data type. So in Java, you're trying to assign an in, a string to an integer. It will give you an error, to the best of my knowledge. This is basically the equivalent to the, hey, data type mismatch errors you get in languages like Java and C. However, I am going to point something out. Um, Instead of Bob here in the name, I'm actually going to punch in a bunch of numbers, okay? And I'm going to run it. In actual fact, I did this for my previous group, and I totally expected an error, and I got no error. Um, and then I, I suddenly remembered why. What just happened is we just coerced the database. We just made it do something it didn't want to do. We forced it to do something. What's happening is name is a string. We fed it a number. The database server says, I can take this number and make a string out of it. So it's called data type coercion. You are basically telling the data type that it's identifying it as something else against its will. So if I go select star from a parent table, and I go hit go, there it is right here. It became a, a character string instead of being an integer. It is, it is not a number. It will never be a number. It is now a string. Whether it wants to be a string or not, it is now a string. Make sure to follow your data so it matches the data type of the matching column when you're inserting data because you may have unexpected behavior. You could get an error, which is good. Because that means you're, it caught it. In this case, this is wrong, but it allowed it to happen because it goes, I can handle this. I'll just make myself a string now. And away it goes. No error messages. You don't even know anything went wrong. Just be careful is the point of this particular topic. Now, I am going to go to doing the updates. So, update a parent table set name equal to Jane. 
Now, does anybody here have any kind of database background? Hey. So what do you think is going to happen if I run this command as is? Yes, they're all going to become Jane. No, even if I put in a semicolon, it makes no difference. They all become Jane. Because I'm not telling it which one is supposed to become Jane. You all become Jane. And remember when I said there's no such thing as undo? Here's the other thing about database servers. It's really freaking fast. You don't even have time to realize you screwed up until you go and look at the data and you go, huh, oops. So what you're supposed, this is known as a bulk update. A little dangerous. What you should be doing, and this is something you're gonna learn, start to learn next week, but I gotta show it to you here so that, you know, where ID is equal to one, and I'm gonna make Bob be equal to one. I'm gonna hit run. Now you'll, oops, it's not ID. Uh, parent ID. Update one, that's a good number. When you see update 12, or in one case when I wasn't, I didn't have enough coffee, I saw update 47,000. I was having a bad day. I was glad I had a backup. And that nobody else had touched that database that day yet. Um, so you can set different criteria. This is basically how you filter what you're going to affect. Now I'm going to insert some data into the child table. In, insert into a child table parent id name values and actual fact you'll notice it doesn't really make a difference where you put the parentheses um you just do whatever you want um parent id one and uh this is going to be jill and i'm going to run that Yay. Oops. Child name. So just so you know, uh, it's telling me that column doesn't exist. I think the error message is pretty obvious. The column doesn't exist. It means that you typed something in that wasn't there. Let's try that again. Boom. I added a child record. If I were to go select star from a child table, yeah, you'll notice I haven't done deletes yet, eh? I'll, I'll be, I'm preparing myself for that. So here's my child record. Here's the parent ID. Here's its sequence. I can add, oops, I can add a bunch of children. This person was very busy. Had lots of kids. Six kids. And so I've got a table with child records in it. It's great. Um, now, I'm going to start deleting parent records. So I'm going to go, um, actually, I need to do one more thing. Update uh, a parent table set name equal to Jim, where ID is equal to two. Select star from a parent table. Bang. Uh, again, come on, Dan. How many times am I make that mistake? Go. Okay. You will notice something a little quirky. Did you notice that up here, the two, the two that I've been mod updating have now gone to the bottom of the results coming back? This is something that's specific to Postgres, the database server you guys are using. So don't panic if you update a row and you don't see it. That's because it's now at the end of the table. Postgres does what's called a conservative update. What it does is it goes, oh, I'm updating record six. What it'll actually do is it'll create a new record with all the values, ignoring the primary key and ignoring all the everything else. If it successfully writes that record in, 
it then deletes the original version. If it fails, the original version is still there and it's untouched. That's known as a conservative write. Um, that's just technical inside stuff inside of Postgres. That actually throws a lot of people for a loop when they're coming in from like MySQL or Microsoft SQL Server when they go to Postgres and they go, my record order is shifting. Well, yeah, it's just how Postgres works. Um, unlike MySQL that just goes YOLO, here's the data. Like it, it'll actually modify the active record and if it fails, that active record could get corrupted. MySQL is a fantastic product. Um, if it disappeared tomorrow, you wouldn't see me be sad. Um, but it's around. So that's one thing I wanted to point out to you guys. And before I continue, I need to go grab, um, no, not that one. Copy this. Oh, I have that one already. I just don't want to lose my history for you guys. Uh, insert into copy. There we go. There's a parent insert. Uh, and I'm going to go update copy. Copy. I just want to get, give you guys the working commands. Insert copy paste. Okay. So now I'm going to come back over here and I'm going to go back to my insert of the child. And here's an error message that you guys may experience. I'm going to try to insert it with a parent ID that does not exist. It's going to go run. It's going to go, oopsie daisy, forgot my semicolon. Insert update on table, a child table violates foreign key constraint. Parent ID, whatever that number is, is not present in the parent. So basically you're saying, hey child, you're going to exist. Your parent is fictional. The database server is saying, you're not allowed to have a child with a fictional parent. The child must have a real parent. That's, you know, that whole point of you guys creating those lines in the diagram and learning about this whole one to many, mandatory, not mandatory? This is why. It's to avoid corruption in your data. You cannot add data that does not work. These are known as integrity constraints. In other words, it's making sure that you maintain the integrity of your database. You can't give the database cancer, data cancer. Okay. So now you guys have seen insert, you've seen update. Now I'm going to go and do a happy little delete. Delete from a parent table. What's going to happen? Yes. Or at least that's what you think is going to happen. I'm going to run it. Update a delete on parent at parent table violates for and key constraint. You're not allowed to kill the parents unless you kill the kids first. You got to wipe out the whole family. Cool. See, this is such a dark way of teaching this. But you'll never forget it. So you're not allowed to delete records. The one thing that's really good about Postgres is, hang, hang on, I'll show this from a parent table like this. Everything is still there, even though I said delete all. Postgres is smart enough that it started deleting and it said, hey, I just noticed that there's child records. This is going to cause a problem. Your command sucks. Let's pretend it never happened. This is the closest to an undo you have in Postgres. It will not let you do bad things unless you ex go out of your way to do bad things. So you can't delete the child record without deleting the parent. So if I want to delete with the parent record, I would have to go delete from a child table. And I could delete everything in the child table. Cool. And I will do that momentarily. Because I'm gonna this is known as a bulk delete. It don't care. It's also gonna be really fast. 66 milliseconds. Um, I'm pretty sure there's nobody in this room with an APM that fast. So 
beware. So now I could go delete from a um, a parent parent table, but I'm actually going to do it properly where ID is equal to one, just so you can see what happens when you delete a single row. You go run, and it's not come on. It's because of the database I work with at during the day. All the primary keys are called ID. So my brain automatically picks it as just ID. There, delete one. That's the kind of delete message you actually want. You don't want to see delete one million. Um, not saying I ever did that. Um, delete, actually, once you get past a certain number of rows, delete gets a little slow. Because when you do a delete, the problem is that for every row you're deleting, it's got to go check the ancestry. So it's got to check, see if it's, there's a child record. If there is, can it delete it or not? Then it goes to see if that child record has a child record. So it's got to go through the whole family tree to see if it's allowed to delete the record. Um, which will lead me to the very last command tonight, truncate, which is that last slide I stopped on, a parent table. Truncate does something similar to delete without the where clause. You run it. And I'll truncate table reference. Okay, let me just go. I'm going to truncate a child, child table for now, even though there's no data in it. Truncate. It just says truncate table. It doesn't even tell you what was affected. So the way delete works, it goes delete. Row two, can I delete it? Yes, no. Delete. Truncate goes, you're empty. You can do a cascade truncate, it's dangerous. Uh, not recommend, not all database servers support cascaded truncates. If you have the on delete cascade, then you can truncate. Truncate basically tells a database server, bruh. You're empty. That's it. Don't even look at see if there's anything on the disk. As far as you're concerned, you are now empty. It is very fast. Again, that's a, like a, I did that by accident once on a, at 5:30 where I truncated the wrong table by accident. I had a backup. You'll notice a, a, a repeating phrase. You know, I've been doing this for 27 years. In 27 years, you're bound to screw up several times. Especially at 5.30 in the morning when the coffee has not finished going through your system yet. I, and the best part is I didn't realize there was anything wrong for half an hour. I just couldn't understand why whatever I was trying to do wasn't working. So I kept running the truncate over and over and over again. Truncating nothing. So, truncate. Truncate is like delete, a, a, a bulk delete, except instead of um, deleting each row one at a time, it literally marks the table as empty. It's instant. There's no avoiding it. Yeah. Oh, no. Delete deletes the value. Delete and truncate will do the same thing. It's how it does it is different. Delete and truncate don't damage the table. It affects the data in the table. So another way to do an example of a delete versus truncate. Let's go back to our filing cabinet example. We open up the filing cabinet. We grab a file folder. We grab the first page. We go, oh, we can get rid of that one. We can get rid of that one. We can get rid of that one. Truncate. Just take the whole folder and just toss the contents. Yeah. Okay, so truncate a million rows will take milliseconds. Delete a million rows could take 10 seconds. I know 10 seconds doesn't sound a lot for a million, but 10 seconds is a long time as far as the database server is concerned. Um, that's the first thing. Two. Truncate is not something you use regularly. Truncate is often used on uh, when you're doing a data load or you're storing, you're calculating values and storing them in the database. 
So remember when we were talking about derived values last semester, like the last semester, first half of the semester, and how sometimes you want to include the derived values in the database for performance reasons so that you don't have to calculate on the fly. Another thing is sometimes you'll want to create summaries of the data in the database and store them. But maybe you want to refresh it every night so you truncate those tables so that you refresh it every day. Or you're going to do an ETL, what they call an electronic transform and load. So you have a temporary table. You load the data from the disk into the temporary table, modify it, put it into the rest of the system. Next time you do a load, you have to truncate the table. It's a maintenance command. Okay? All right, now back to the slide decks, so to make sure I don't forget anything. Um, one more thing. Reset surrogate key values to the initial value. Only true for MySQL. Maybe Microsoft SQL Server, I don't know, because I've never tried it with my SQL, Microsoft SQL Server. In Postgres, Oracle, and IBM DB2, the sequence stays the same. So in other words, if you're on five and you truncate the table, the next one will be six. You, it doesn't reset it. In MySQL, it resets it to one. That's the big difference. Okay. Uh, index, we're going to talk about at the end of the term. I forgot to delete the slide. Uh, here's varying versions of the insert statement, which I showed you guys already. Um, you can actually do an insert statement without specifying the columns that you're inserting if you're going to insert every single value. However, if you have a surrogate key, you're not going to define that value, so you might as well specify all the columns. Remember earlier I was talking about how I'd rather people write out explicitly what they're going to do so that you know what you're doing? Better to be explicit with your inserts than just assuming it's going to work right. Because you know what hap you know what happens when you assume, right? You make an ass out of you and me. Uh, here's the update. You can actually do multiple columns at once in an update. Actually, I forgot to mention it to the other group. You can do multiple columns at once. You just comma delimit them. So you do value one equal to this, comma value two equal to this, and no comma at the end once you're done. Um, Update, bulk update. I already showed you guys what happens when you do that. Um, you can actually, instead of targeting a specific row, you can target a set of rows. I'll show you guys how to do that kind of stuff next week. Um, we're not even going to talk about that because that's overly complicated and we're not even going to discuss that kind of concept till like three weeks from now. So whoever put these slides together wanted to really have cover every single example you could do without ever touching them. Um, I've never seen a question on the exam for this, so pretty safe. Uh, here's our happy delete. Usually include the where, otherwise, you know, whatever. Um, all right. That is the end. Now, I am going to mention one more thing for everybody panics and runs away. I had to intercept you. I'm actually going to talk for like two minutes about assignment two. Nice and early even though it's not even released yet. Okay, number one, same rules of engagement as the first one. It's group work in your lab. Done, eh? If you hate your partners, you can use someone else. Nice. My daughter and I do that all the time. We'll walk past each other and go, fuck you. So mature as a parent, right? Um. Anyways, um, what I covered today covers half the assignment. I shit you not. This is literally part one and part two of four parts of the assignment. It's not released, but this is a chance when I tell you guys, this is a good time to find your partners again and start setting yourselves up with your partners so that when the assignment is released, you start right away. So review what I did. Literally lab six is a simplified version of the first half of the assignment. So do lab six, understand what lab six is doing, and you'll be halfway through your assignment. And that was the end of my announcements for today. You have a question. Two questions. I don't know who went first. You first. Yes, two to three, not four. I don't think this is a group where I had a group of four that just showed up and had a group of four. 
When's what? Assignment two? Um, I think next week. I have to double check because I can't release it before the other profs release theirs. Uh, I am doing mine slightly different from the other sections, just so you know. Um, I am giving you guys the diagram that you're going to build from. Other profs are going to make you use your assignment one. Not your lab profs. The other lecture profs are making you use what you did in assignment one as your assignment two starting point, which is a very terrible thing. Then you're... Thanks for saying it for me. But yeah, that's the situation. So that was it. So I'll be releasing assignment two. So you guys know you've already seen a good chunk of what you're going to need today. Today was a dense lecture. A lot of small topics covered. But not one topic is a big topic that's hard to understand. You just have to take them one piece at a time. There was a hand here before you. Yeah, post, uh, PG Admin. Yeah, I'm working with Postgres so you guys can develop good habits. Hey? Okay. Um, okay, I'll go and make it public. Just send me an email to rem remind me because I'll forget by the time I get home. I didn't. I haven't, I haven't read the weekly schedule in like three years because I teach the same thing every freaking semester. <laughs> so somebody else updated the weekly schedule. I grabbed the you know the the course weekly schedule and I forgot to double check what happened in the second half. Yeah. Yeah, that's how I'm submitting the lab. That's how you submit the labs. Well, it depends. If you're working against a database server directly, you'll probably run one command at a time, two commands at a time, unless it's a big script. You'll be doing exactly what I was doing today. When you're programming, you're actually creating the SQL statements in code. So Java is actually creating a string that has your SQL command in it, and you're going to execute it. It's completely different. Yeah. Um, this one only keeps so much history. Uh, I, I think there's a setting somewhere to make it keep more history. And the second you close this, the history is gone. It's only for the session. Just so you know. Uh, keeping. There. All right. That's it. Well, it depends what depends what tool you use. Like not everybody's going to use PG admin. They might use data grip. They might use something else. Data grip keeps a better history. Data grip actually save your history to a file. You can actually go dig through your file and go find your old commands. Different tools. It depends where you work. They're going to give you different rules of engagement. You just develop your own habits. No problem. Did you have a question?